this might be only the beginning of Trump's troubles. This week, a judge confirmed that the first of his four criminal trials will move forward beginning next month. Joining me now is one of the key witnesses in this case, one of the people who helped kick off this investigation, Michael Cohen. He previously served as a counsel to Donald Trump. He's the author of the New York Times best-selling books, Revenge, How Donald Trump Weaponized the Department of Justice Against His Critics and Disloyal, a memoir, as well as the host of his podcasts, Mea Culpa, with Michael Cohen and the political beatdown. Michael, welcome. I, I've got a lot to talk to you about, but I, <laughs> I, I, I want to ask you first how you're feeling about this. Um, I think Tish James and the prosecutors did an excellent job. Uh, I'm obviously ecstatic with the decision that was put out by Judge and Goron, specifically pages 41 through 43, that refer to me and corroborate the fact that I told the truth, that I continue to tell the truth, that I have continuously told the truth once I exculpated myself from the Trump um, orbit. Let me uh, read a little bit about that, what Judge Ngoron said about you. Uh, he said, um, uh, Cohen testified that although Do Donald Trump did not expressly direct him to reverse engineer financial statements, he ordered him to do so indirectly in his mob voice. Although the animosity between the witness uh, and, and the defendant is palpable, pro providing Cohen with an incentive to lie, the court found his testimony credible. Based on the relaxed manner in which he testified, the general plausibility of his statements, and most importantly, the way his testimony was corroborated by other trial evidence. A less forgiving fact finder might have concluded differently, might not have believed a single word of a convicted perjurer. This fact finder does not believe that pleading guilty to perjury means that you can never tell the truth. Michael Cohen told the truth. Yeah, and again, so I would thank Judge Ngoron. I would like just to point one thing out. The answer is yes, I did plead guilty under um, a 1001 violation when I had lied to Congress. But something, including many of the pundits that are on these shows, like Lisa Rubin I was watching this morning, they're talking about the perjury and the fact that I had pled guilty to it. I want to be really clear of what the perjury was. It was the number of times that I claimed to have spoken to Trump about a failed Trump Tower Moscow real estate project. The true answer was 10. But Donald didn't like the number 10. He wanted three. And along with guys like Alan Garten or Jay Sekulow and Ty Cobb and Abby Lowell and Ivanka and Jared, a whole slew of people were involved in the crafting of that statement. They wanted three. Mm -hmm. So I said three. That's the lie. I don't think that that lie compared to not just the documentary evidence, which supported everything that I had said while I was on the stand, but the corroborating testimony of other witnesses. Judge Ngoron is absolutely correct. I told the truth. So let's talk about lying. Part of the reason that this case gets under Donald Trump's skin so much, there are a few reasons. One of them is that you're a witness in it. One of them is that he hates uh, Tish James. But but really key to this whole thing is it, it pokes a hole. It takes the air out of the myth of Donald Trump uh, that you told Congress about, that he inflates his wealth. He lies about his wealth. Basically, and Goron in the summary judgment in September said, you're a myth. You're built on a lie. You're a fraudulent person. And that seems to bother Donald Trump yet more than the fact that he faces losing his liberty and going to jail. Well, I'm not so sure. Right now, he's not confronted with that aspect, which is what will be uh, starting on March 25th at the criminal trial. These have all been civil so far, and he has lost. He continues to lose in each and every one of these cases. And my prediction is he loses on all 91 counts that were brought against wow. him. But Donald is only, he's like a donkey. He could only see the carrot in front of his nose. And what's the carrot right now in front of his nose? A half a billion dollars plus in civil fines between E. Jean Carroll and now the Tish James uh, civil fraud case. When he's going to be confronted in 27 days from now, or is it 37, 37 days um, from now, at the district attorney of New York's case, the Alvin Bragg case, rest assured that will be priority to him because, yes, losing your freedom is probably worse for most people than losing money. Right. I can tell you that from fact, you know, from personal experience. 
But for Donald, they're equal. So let's talk about that case, because you're involved in that one as well. And I don't know how much you can tell me without killing me. Um, but, uh, <laughs> you know, we, we talk about this one as a civil fraud case. And the point I like to make is that it's much bigger than that. Same thing with the other one. We talk about it as the hush money case. But it's actually the, the, the issue at hand is whether it was election interference. Uh, where, how do you think that case is? Well, I think that's only part of it. And yes, everybody likes to call it the Stormy Daniels case because it's salacious, right? The president and the porn star. It's not. It's business fraud uh, as well as campaign finance. I really can't go into any of the sum and substance of what's going on in the case and so on for obvious reasons. Right. I want to protect the integrity of the trial right. going forward. And obviously, I'm going to have to deal with Blanche and Neshley's in their cross-examination. They will do or try to do to me what Donald has told them to do, right. which is attack him, attack his credibility. So far, I have testified before seven congressional committees. I've been with the district attorney more than 25 times, including grand jury. I've been now a witness for several days with the New York attorney general case. That's the Ngoron decision. Has anybody turned around and questioned my credibility? That's why I find it um, foolish when they want to start to bring that up. They need to work on the documents. They need to work on their case, not to win their case by attacking me. That's right. not going to work. They need to figure out how to win their own case based upon whatever evidence that they think they can provide. So one of the arguments in the E. Jean Carroll, the latest judgment, was uh, how much money is it going to take to cause Donald Trump to stop? Um, in this particular case, this was a disgorgement. This is money that 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 is been determined that he defrauded uh, the taxpayers of New York. What changes Donald Trump's behavior? Does $500 million change Donald Trump's behavior? Because uh, according to Truth Social, nothing changes his behavior. He just keeps on posting the same stuff about how it's all What else is he supposed to do at this point? There is a, now a judgment against him for over $500 million, not including the $88.6 million he's going to owe to E. Jean Carroll. It's an enormous amount of money that he does not have. I don't care what anybody wants to write in any newspaper, regardless of what their credentials may be, unless he's going to show you that his bank account has more than a half a million. He doesn't have 400 million of cash on hand. Maybe what he's doing is he's including RNC money or he's including the PAC money or he's including the various different condominium money that's sitting in CapEx accounts that do, they do not belong to him. Right. Those don't belong to him either. He has a very interesting way of looking at money. And the way he looks at it is, if his name is somehow attached to that... It's available. It's to available him. to him. It yeah. is not. Right. And he doesn't have it. They're going to have to start liquidating assets. Uh, yeah, he, and that becomes the issue. He's got assets worth, we think, more than half a million he dollars. He does. But, but cash is going to be the right. issue. Now, I do want to say this also, something people aren't taking into consideration. When those assets are sold... Because Donald Trump has had them since 1980, and he acquired them for either like 40 Wall Street for $1 million or parking lots, restaurants, uh, commercial space that he owns here in the city. He acquired those as the developer of the property. He has a zero basis in those properties. When he sells them, he has to pay taxes on them just as anybody else. And depending upon his tax bracket, remember, you have city, state and federal tax. Right. That also doesn't include whether or not this case is now going to be sent to the IRS. Which if, we, we believe that uh, Tish James has sent it both to the federal investigators to look at again and the IRS. Not only if it goes to the IRS, it also goes to the state tax department. Right. The New York City Department of Taxation and, fin uh, and Finance, as well as the state Department of Taxation and Finance. This number is substantially greater even than the $500 million that everyone's talking about. I've been looking forward to talking to you, my friend. Thank you for being with us again, and I suspect we're going to have more occasion to talk. In the <laughs> I think so.